and welcome to Shedding Starlight, your guide to the Kingdom Hearts mythos. We've been covering a lot of the events revolving around Sora so far, who makes his way through the upper floors of Castle Oblivion, fighting for his precious memories. But today, we're going to discuss Riku, who's in the castle's underbelly, the basement floors, and his fight for something entirely different, as Naminé never touches his memory. Instead, Riku is fighting for independence from Ansem, and for the hope he can redeem himself for his past mistakes. Another struggle Riku overcomes in Chain of Memories is his relationship to darkness, and whether or not he would keep using it for power. The replica of Riku represents the ideal, what Riku could be if he only had the nerve, the strength, to take what he wants at least according to Ansem and the replica itself. Before Naminé completely reforms the replica's heart into believing it was really Riku, the replica was proud to be artificial, because it saw itself to be lacking all of the real Riku's weaknesses. Unlike you, I fear nothing. While Riku believes he's vulnerable to the darkness, it seems those who want to use Riku see the situation differently. Riku's enemies see a strength within him that he doesn't see in himself, even being referred to as the Hero of Darkness. No one's ever won the darkness the way that he does. It's impossible! While Riku was at first afraid of the darkness and found a way to overcome that fear, another one of his struggles was with Ansem. Whenever Riku is spoken to by Ansem, only sometimes is it legitimately what's left of the man from the first game. But there are other times when it's actually Diz speaking to Riku, pretending to be Ansem. This is even more confusing when you realize that in English, Ansem has a completely new voice actor in Chain of Memories from the original game, so you don't recognize his voice when you're meant to. So how can you tell if the Ansem speaking to Riku is the real one or Diz in disguise? Well, Diz, who first spoke to Riku in the beginning of the game, takes a more observational role curious to see if Riku will choose light or darkness. The real Ansem, on the other hand, is dead set on Riku returning to darkness. He wants Riku once again to rely on him for power and in turn do his bidding. But if Ansem was defeated in the first game, how can he exist now? While one might think he's only a figment in Riku's mind, or that he's a memory projection like the card worlds, Ansem is actually still alive, in a sense, as Zexion was able to smell him, and he poses a genuine threat to Riku. It seems through the part of him that lives on in Riku, he still has a foot in the door, for his ominous last words are, Your darkness, I gave it all to you, my dark shadow, Lingers, someday I will return! Ansem and Darkness are tightly linked, particularly with Riku's experiences. So the stronger the darkness that Riku uses to fight his way through Castle Oblivion, the more he strengthens Ansem with his heart as well. However, Riku seems to not only have ties to Ansem, but also to the superior, the leader of the organization. When Riku first fights and defeats Ansem near the beginning of his route, Zexion says that a smell similar to their superiors defeated another smell resembling Maleficent's. In this situation, Ansem resembles Maleficent, most probably because they both control darkness, and Riku is compared to the superior. Even later, when Lexius is defeated by Riku, he also begins to compare him to the superior before holding back the thought. You are the superiors. In Chain of Memories, smelling someone simply refers to sensing their vibes or aura. This is why Ansem smelled like Maleficent and why Naminé and Kairi smell the same. In the original Japanese, the words used are closer to just sensing people. But either way, sensing or smelling isn't as prevalent in future games. Think of it as a cute Chain of Memories quirk. While Sora has long had the company of Donald, Goofy, and Jiminy, Riku has been alone. During his path through the castle, 
unlike Sora, he doesn't mean anyone in the card world besides Maleficent. She says his heart is empty, and that were it not for his darkness, he would be completely alone. Thankfully, throughout Shade of Memories, we see a blossoming friendship between him and King Mickey. The Little King saves Riku from Ansem's clutches throughout the game. Some of those times Mickey wasn't even physically present, yet was still able to trace the connection between his and Riku's hearts. What's interesting between Mickey and Naminé, the other friend Riku made in Castle Oblivion, is that they both have their own advice for Riku. Mickey tells Riku that there will always be light in the darkness to show him the way. However, Naminé helps Riku move forward, telling him by facing the darkness head on, following it without shying away, he'll gain a new strength unlike any other and find the way to his friends. This is critical advice that sets Riku on a new path. Naminé showed Riku that he can use the power of darkness for himself, not for Ansem, Maleficent, or anyone else. In the beginning of his path through Castle Oblivion, Riku struggles coming to peace with his mistakes and carries this burden alone. Even though Ansem is defeated, remnants of him follow in Riku's shadow. But with Mickey as a new companion, Naminé giving life-changing advice, and now that Riku knows Sora is resting safely in Naminé's hands, Riku has friends to fill his heart's cavity once created by darkness and loneliness. Everybody, welcome to the discussion portion of this week's episode on Riku and Ansem. Yeah. Hannah, how are you doing today? I'm good. I started my day early and like, I'm here. I'm ready to talk about Riku because I fucking love Riku. I love him. He's great. He's great. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to address with this is that in writing this script, I realized that... To me, a lot of what the enemies talk to Riku about is they always say, like, you're too scared to use the darkness. You're too <laughs> chicken. Like, like yeah. you used to have, you used to be braver and now you're not or whatever. And it really reminds me of the line Riku says in the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 1 before Destiny Islands falls to darkness where Riku goes, like, I'm not afraid of the darkness. And I think in that yeah. moment, he really means it. So yeah. I think that it just goes to show, even though he won't admit it in Chain of Memories, he is scared of the darkness because of everything he's been through, the things that he has done. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. think it's just such a turn for his character. Yeah. Riku truly lives a million lives already <laughs> in these two <laughs> games. Because, like, yeah, that shows, like, him... Being that way at the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 1, you know, he was so desperate to get off the island. Like, he was willing to traverse into darkness to do it, to, you know, get a different life. And that's just kind of that childlike naivete mm -hmm. of him, of, you know, kind of plunging in headfirst without really knowing what you're doing. And then after the whole journey of Kingdom Hearts 1 and figuring out you know, he's been hurting his friends this whole time. He's been hurting Sora. He's been hurting Kairi. And now he is afraid of that happening again. Yeah. And then after that, going through the whole arc of this game of being like, hey, maybe like this is a unique thing about me. Maybe I can use this to my advantage without hurting the ones I love. Yeah. So you are so real for calling Riku naive in Kingdom Hearts 1 because I don't think that that's an adjective people would typically describe Riku as because yeah. there's always Sora to compare to Riku. And so yeah. I don't think like trusts enemies or bad guys or whatever, mm -hmm. but I still would think that people tend to call Sora naive before Riku. Yeah. But it's true. You're right. Like yeah. he did. They both are. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. It's like, you know, we've said this a million times, this game is about kids and like Riku is seen as like the older brother figure and like, you know, for people who have older siblings, you know, if you grew up with them, then 
they're the person you look up to and Riku is the person that Sora looks up to, but he's still a kid. He's not that much older than Sora. Yeah. You know, he likes to pretend that he knows what he's doing, but... That's really how it feels, though. I remember when I was a kid, when I was 14, I was like, 15 is so old. I know. And now that I'm... <laughs> In my fucking 20s, mid-20s, I'm like, yeah, wow, you're a whole month older than your friend. Like, way to go. I remember when I was, like, probably, like, 9 or 10, I was like, I can't wait to be 12. Like, 12 is, like, I don't know why. I just really liked that number. I'm like, 12 is going to be so old and I'm going to know, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, Yeah. It's Gosh. funny. I swear to God, the older I get, the small... I feel like Sora and Riku and Kairi, every single game release, they, like, shrink their models. Like, they get shorter <laughs> and smaller. Every- yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's like... I think I've said this before, but it's wild to think about that. I think I was younger than Sora when I first played these games, and now I am yeah. twice his age, <laughs> I think, yeah. at this point. Um, but, yeah, they're just little babies. Just, you know, thrown into this fantasy universe. Yeah. It's past Trying to bedtime. figure it out. Go to bed. <laughs> Dinner's ready. Go eat dinner, Sora. <laughs> Dinner's ready. <laughs> um, so my first point that I wrote down here, um, I think we're gonna talk about this more later, according to Mel, but I this whole script was kind of about the relationship between Riku and Ansem, and then we talked about Diz, and I was just kind of curious. Um, if we, I felt like we had already discussed this maybe, but I couldn't remember if we had talked about how, how Diz can talk to Riku as Ansem or at all. Yeah. Like if he has some sort of connection with Riku that allows him to do that. Yeah. It's definitely weird. I don't think we've talked about it. If we have, Uh I've completely blocked it from memory. (laughs) Um, but I do think, so hopefully Diz can have his own episode. Um, I'm just a little worried that if we do, it might be a little bit shorter because he's just so yeah. mysterious. There's so much we don't know about him. Mm-hmm. But I do think that there's got to be some connection between Diz and Ansem, not even Riku, but Ansem himself. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about this more in his episode. But like, if you look underneath the red rags of, of yeah. Diz, he, to me... Looks exactly like Ansem. Yeah, he does. And so, I agree. there's just there's something weird going on there, especially because it's not referenced. It's not Riku doesn't go like, "You look like Ansem, dude." Like, yeah. what's going? On? Like, nobody, nobody. Like, the closest thing we have is Mickey going like, "I think I've met him before." Yeah, and that's it. You know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. there's definitely something weird going on there, but unfortunately. We can't talk about yeah. it yet because we don't fucking know. Yeah. yeah, one we don't know, and two it's not his episode, so he can fucking wait in line, get in the back of the queue. Yeah, it is very weird. Like he does look exactly the same with those weird orange eyes and yeah. the dark skin tone, but they don't have the same voice actor, so that's that's true. That's true. You know, thumbs up there. Yeah. Um. So, <laughs> speaking of Rico and Ansem, um. It took me a bit to kind of wrap my head around this idea of when Zexion is talking about um, the smells of uh, the superior and Maleficent. Yeah. Um, I had to rewatch the cutscenes to kind of get through this through my head. I know, yeah. Because they're making like... I wasn't quite sure just reading it from your script what the connection they were trying to make there was. Yeah. But it seems like so after rewatching it, um, it seems like they are not making a direct connection between I think what was really tripping me up was Riku and the superior, like those two specifically. Hmm. What was really tripping me up is I, I thought they were trying to make a connection directly between the two of them, but I think what it actually is is that there's not a direct connection between them, but it's just like they're they how do I explain this? It's the the actual quote is his existence was once doubled in darkness, and that's their explanation as to why Riku and the superior 
have similar vibes. So they've like been through the same thing. So they have the so similar who's, vibe. Who's his existence? Are you saying the superior's existence or Riku's existence? I think Riku. I think that yeah. So okay. his, I think I'm pretty sure he's talking about Riku there. So Riku's existence was once doubled in darkness. So, you know, implying that that is similar to the superior. And that's why they smell the same, not because they have a connection. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And that kind of reminds me of... I wasn't sure if we had already talked about... Because I think we did with Sunny, right? What, what... Maybe we didn't. What light smells like. What darkness smells like. Yeah, we yeah we talked about that. We asked what Castle Oblivion smells like. I think the... Okay, so it was Castle Oblivion. But like... I want to say all darkness smells the same and that all light smells the same, but I don't know if that's true because Zexion said specifically smells like Maleficent. And so yeah. I don't know if if two people's darkness can smell alike. Which that makes a lot more sense. Like if that's true, that makes it a lot easier to grasp, I think, that people can, like, you know... So to compare something in real life, something can smell bad, but they can smell bad in different ways. Something can smell mm. good, but it can smell good in different ways. Yeah. that If that's similar with light and dark, I think that would make a lot of sense, especially, yeah. like, here, when you're talking about, like, people. Yeah. And, like, how they use their darkness and how the darkness affects them and stuff like that. And I guess, you know, um, we also have to take into account that I, that in the Japanese, it's not about smelling. It's not right, about right, the right. sense, the, the scent of the nose or whatever. It's just about mm-hmm. people's vibes and auras. So I guess in that sense, like, people can have dark auras, but it doesn't necessarily mean they have, like, the same vibes or yeah. people can have dark vibes, but not this. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hard to fucking talk about it because... You know, maybe I'm just not sensitive, but, like, I don't feel like people have auras in real life. I can't fucking. <laughs> you don't no. get it, Mel. You're not a psychic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was just something that I took some time, some extra time to try to, like, wrap my head around. Yeah, especially there. because, like, I tried my best to write it in a clear way. But mm. when cutscenes have, like, four different names... And, like, two of them are comparing it to each other. It's hard to write. It's hard to write in a clear way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I do apologize if anybody else listening was like, what? Yeah. Yeah. That's why we're talking about it. That's why, that's what this whole discussion portion is about. I feel like for the past few episodes and some episodes in season one, it's kind of been like A is B, B is C. Like, you know, we get it. But it's like stuff like this where it's like, yeah. This is what this is kind of made for, so we can have a back and forth. You're so right. It. You're so right. <laughs> um, speaking of the superior, one thing that I do think is interesting is how not even just Riku, but like if you're right in that they both smell like darkness, but but um two different smells. There is that other time where Riku is fighting Lexeus. And he mm-hmm. goes, like, you are the superiors, dot, dot, dot. And then he, like, I, he either fades away or he apologizes to Zexion or whatever. But either way, he doesn't finish the thought. And either way, I think there's something weird about, like, throwaway lines in Castle Oblivion that involves not just Riku, but Kairi and Sora as well. Where Naminé yeah. is like, I'm the shadow of Kairi. Yeah. And then Vexen is like, this town is from the other side of your heart or whatever, you know? And it's just <laughs> yeah. interesting that Chain of Memories, out of nowhere, seems to be making these connections to these three kids that we yeah. thought we knew everything about. Like, we feel like, I feel like we've seen their whole life story. Like, they yeah. lived on a boring island for most of it. Yeah, so they it's just to leave. Yeah, it's just interesting that there's things going on about them that we don't know yet and that they clearly don't know yet. 
Yeah. I really want to fucking know what Lexius was about to say. I want to know what he was going to (laughs) say. Me fucking too. (laughs) I can't fucking stand that shit when people write characters not finishing their sentences. Yeah. I can't stand it. But yeah, so that, um, that point led me to ask, and I know, I know that there's going to be a lot of people that know the answer to this. And I don't know if we know the answer to this. And if we don't, I apologize. Um, But that makes me wonder, since this is, we're specifically talking about the remake of this game. Mm. um, Was all of that, like, dialogue and stuff completely true to the original uh, Game Boy Advance game? Because, like, that makes me wonder. I don't... (laughs) Don't fucking <laughs> tie me to a post and burn me in the town square for not playing the original <laughs> Game Boy Advance game. But since this is a remake, it makes me wonder if they like put clues to the future because mm-hmm. this is a remake and the second game had already been made. Yeah, um, that's a good good question. So do you know how much like if it's all if this is all there, all these clues? All these I, weird things? I don't know. I actually don't know that much about the Game Boy Advance, except that, I mean, the Game Boy Advance version of the game, right. except for, like, the way it looks, because I'm obsessed with sprites and pixel art, so I would yeah. always look it up on the Spriter's resource. Uh-huh. Um, and I will say that, like, from what I can remember, all the bosses are the same. All, you know, there's nothing... I don't remember anything missing from like the spritersresource.com that like you end up seeing in the PS2 version. Right. Um cuz Riku's story is in the in the Game Boy Advance game, right? Or yeah, I not? think so. I feel like yeah. I remember seeing sheets of all his different sprites. That makes me want to Okay, hold on. If anything, I Take wonder if some nerd, oh, please god, please I love nerds. I love you. Please <laughs> If somebody wrote, like, the entire script of the original Game Boy Advance game. See, literally, that's what I was about to look at. I was looking Uh, up the original cutscenes on YouTube, but I don't know if they're going to be there. Like, uh, (laughs) Rico dead on the ground in his first (laughs) game is fucking funny. Hold on. (laughs) I have to show you this. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, my Lord. Okay. Okay, so I found this. I know this is the script of the original Game Boy Advance. And I know it because at one point, only in the Game Boy Advance version, does Axel say, it's about time you gave me one hell of a show. And they didn't include that line in the PS2 version. So that's how I know this is from the GBA. (laughs) Um, So let me just type in, like, superior. Yeah, that's the line I was going to look up to see if Lexius still says that. I'm almost there. This playlist is a couple different videos, so I'm scrolling through them. Oh, look at this line that Vexen says. Okay. So he's talking about Marluxia. If if he, if Marluxia gets Sora, then we need only acquire Riku. If he is truly, if he truly is like the superior, then we will be untouchable. Isn't that a <gasps> gag? Oh my, oh my god. god. Oh, wait a minute. So <laughs> oh my the, god. So in a okay. line before, he says, okay, so Zexion says, Riku once shouldered the darkness. Perhaps that made him half dark. That's such an interesting line. And then yeah. Vexen is like, and that's why you mistook him for the superior. Fascinating. The dark power given to Riku facilitated his escape from the realm of darkness. Okay, interesting. Yeah. That's kind of like he, Yeah, he does ago. say that in the in the PS2 version, I believe. mm um, one with ties with both the Keyblade and the Power of Darkness. This merits further research. So I wonder if they're saying, like, if Riku's strength in his darkness is similar to the Superior or something. Yeah. I So Lexius does not say that line. <gasps> no way. Yeah. Such, such power, Lexius says. Riku says, what's wrong? Is that all darkness can do? Well, it seems I'm beaten, but the organization shall triumph. I may perish, but the dark all, all the darkness within me will billow forth and devour you. And then he disappears. Yeah, you're right. He doesn't say that line. Interesting. So some things were changed in between the the original release and the actual game. Or the original release and the, the remake. Weird. Interesting. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
Well, so, question answered. I want to say that I'm a little sad that, you know, we do talk about, you know, obviously the organization is still around because Axel is still around. So, you know, there's, and there's, we only see like six of at least 12 members. So we do know that the organization, even after Chain of Memories, is still, you know, snooping about. Uh Um, But one thing that I'm going to be upfront about is that for some reason, they don't use the term the superior in later games. Yeah. And that kind of makes me a little sad because... I think that that term is so fucking good. I yeah. love it. The superior. It's, it's hot. It sounds powerful. It sounds scary. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. everything. It sets the tone. For, it really does. You know, who who this person is. Someone we're obviously going to be encountering in the future. Yeah. Um. So, crazy. Yeah, I, I agree. I wish they kept it. So, to move on, another point that I... Again, had a little trouble wrapping my head around is Maleficent talking to Riku at the beginning of his route where we talked about the in the the part where we were talking about I don't remember it's somewhere in the script um when Maleficent's talking about how there's nobody in Riku's memories because he can only see. Uh, people who are who are dark. Um, so I again rewatched some of the cutscenes here to kind of get like a fuller explanation of this. And I'm not saying that your explanations aren't amazing and great, Mel. Um, but I yeah, I just yeah. needed some more of the context. Um, so her quote, she says that his heart is steeped in darkness, and he can only see people steeped in that same darkness which is like i wrote here that uh it feels like a little like the castle's fault as to (laughs) to why like i don't know it's just it's a weird little quirk i guess as to like being able to read that darkness in in riku's heart despite like using a card i don't know um And just kind of the whole concept of Riku's heart being empty really kind of threw me for a loop. Mm. Like, what does that mean your heart is empty? But, like, in the actual scene, Maleficent is kind of teasing him because, oh, he cast away his friends and his family and light, you know, to chase the darkness. And now he's saying he threw away the darkness. He cast it away. But did he really? Because she's there. Like, you know, there's still obviously some darkness in you. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing the people who are in darkness. So I don't know. It's just like a wild kind of concept that is like, I don't know. It feels so physical. This like spiritual thing that he's doing. He's like physically casting things away to make his heart empty it's just i don't know it's weird yeah what do you think (laughs) it's hard to because i mean like for me i guess i'm just so practical that like my mind goes to the question like how come riku doesn't see anybody um yeah but then i have to remember that like that's not all kingdom hearts is kingdom hearts right this is something i struggle with and i feel like i've been getting better with the podcast is is analyzing Kingdom Hearts and stories from an emotional point of view. Mm. And so it is kind of weird because I do feel like Maleficent is kind of like saying different things at once. Like, like, you only see me because I'm as evil as you or I'm only as steeped as darkness as you. Or she's like, you only see me because you cast out everyone away except for me and and dark things like me. And so to me, those are like two different answers. And so yeah. either way, I don't know. I guess <laughs> it's hard to have an opinion about this because uh, I unfortunately, Chain of Memories, I've been trying to avoid it in this podcast series. 
Uh-huh. But unfortunately, with chain of memories, my knee-jerk reaction is to just, like, brush things aside and be like, eh, yeah. whatever. It's just chain of memories, like, abstract talk. Like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know? Uh-huh. Yeah. But I know that that's not the point of the of the podcast, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because if someone mm-hmm. is listening to this and genuinely has, like, a question about it of, like, what's really going on here? What does this mean? What does this mean physically for the castle and its abilities and what it's showing Riku? And what does it mean for Riku emotionally and what he's feeling and what he's going through? And I yeah. guess I personally just don't have a hard grasp. I know I just wrote a whole fucking script on this, but... <laughs> yeah. This scene with Maleficent is is weird because, to me, she's implying, like, you're sad and lonely, but for two different reasons, you know? Like, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. And, like, it brings me back to the way that I like to look at things as, like, from a story standpoint mm. of, like... I don't know. Maybe this is just an excuse to uh, get Riku to go on that lonely route just so he can have that contrast with Sora. Uh, Sora revisiting all of his friends that he made along the way. Mm. And, you know, Riku obviously making the choices that he did in Kingdom Hearts 1, you know... I've u- we've used the word contrast so many fucking times in this season already, but, like... I don't know. It just makes it different for him. And it really kind of sets in that loneliness that he's going through. And the point that I wrote after this is whenever Mickey shows up at the towards the end of Riku's route, he literally falls to the ground. He literally falls on his ass because of how relieved he is to mm. see a friend, which is crazy. Like, it's... I don't know. It's just this poor little guy just going, just trying to make things right with himself. And all these adults are just antagonizing him the whole time. I love Riku. I love him so much. You know, um, but, you, yeah. you saying all that makes me kind of remember that the whole thing about what the castle does is that it reflects your memories. So maybe it's not, not even about like, like, what Maleficent says is objectively true, but rather mm-hmm. what Riku thinks of himself. So, mm. like, Riku feels like he's alone because he's like, shit, like, I fucking betrayed my friends. I threw away my home. And, you know, it's not Maleficent saying you did this. It's Riku saying I did this. Yeah. And I guess maybe, you know, when I feel down, I feel like there's a bunch of different reasons why I'm down. And so Mm. I think maybe in that sense, to me, that gives me a more satisfied um, feeling on all these different things that seem to be contradictory, but in the end, they're just different things Riku has clouding his mind and bringing himself down. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, But before we move on, I do want to bring up this one line. This is a text line that's in... Uh, the scene and I just thought it was a really good line Riku is talking to Maleficent and he says if I'm stuck seeing people like you people of the dark I'll take you out one by one and then Maleficent says then you mustn't forget to destroy yourself last and it's like yes. what a hard line ah! like holy fuck yeah. I'm Ugh, telling you line. there's something about like the chain of memory script writing that has such an edge yeah. that I don't know. I just don't feel like we see it in now modern Kingdom Hearts games. But you're yeah. right. That line goes fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Oh, I love this game. I love Kingdom Hearts. I will say writing, doing this, both with Kingdom Hearts 1, but especially this game, actually like sitting down, talking about it, like looking at it over and over, it's really made me appreciate it. Not that I ever disliked Chain of Memories. Yeah. But there's something about like going through it line by line, really analyzing the characters that really gives you such an appreciation for things that you didn't, at least I didn't really appreciate to the full extent before. Yeah, same. Yeah. And it's like, it seems that people who played this game when they were younger, they really fucking love this game. People are very passionate about this game. And we, listen, we see you, we acknowledge you, Mm -hmm. we get it, we understand. Mm -hmm. Where it just took us a little bit longer to get to where you were. We should have been listening to you the whole time. Now, the card mechanics, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and then my last point here, is just kind of sweet, talking about Naminé helping Riku, um, give him the giving him the advice of you know facing the darkness head on as Kyrie, and then you know Riku figuring out that it's Naminé. She's just so smart. I love Naminé. She's she like so she was able to see things that Mickey is not able to see, like see it, see the darkness from a different perspective, which is you know something that was able to set Riku on a new path than anybody else. Like yeah. she clearly has knowledge that no one else does. Like, damn, we love her for that. Yeah, I one yeah I definitely because she you know she is dressed in white. But she uses terms to describe herself like a shadow, you know, and everything in yeah. everything in Chain of Memories is kind of different from Kingdom Hearts 1 because Kingdom Hearts 1 is kind of about like the light and the dark. Mm-hmm. But Chain of Memories is kind of about like, okay, well, what about the in-between? What about that little gray area between those two overpowering powers? Mm-hmm. And I feel like Naminé is there, Castle Oblivion is there. And Naminé tells Riku, hey, you can be here too. It's okay. Mm. Yeah. Like, Mickey seems to be biased towards the light, but you're not fucking awful if you use this power for yeah. your... It, like, yes, Ansem uses darkness for evil to take away the hearts of girls yeah. around the universe or whatever, and Maleficent <laughs> yeah. does it. To fucking antagonize whatever. Uh-huh. You know, but Naminé tells Riku, like, but you can use this power to find your friends. You can yeah. use this power for yourself and for what you want, even though what you want is not evil. You know, and I feel like that's probably something Riku had literally never heard before. Yeah. You know? And so while it does take him a while to kind of get to that point, um... I think, you know, by the end of the game, Riku says, you know, I'm not taking the road of light or darkness. I'm taking the one in between. Yeah. He really, I think, really takes her advice to heart. Which yeah. um, kind of reminds me. So, you know, moving over to emails, we got an email from our friend Josh. Hi, Hi Josh. Josh. Um, Josh. No offense, I will have to shorten your email down. <laughs> I wouldn't say this or do this to anybody else, but you and me and Hannah are friends. You stayed at Hannah's <laughs> house. Like, I'm going to say this to you because, you know, you need honesty, you know? <laughs> anyway, I shorten your question down a little. But J- Josh asks, one of my favorite things about Riku is him becoming a hero despite his affiliation with darkness. Lots of Final Fantasy games and spinoffs really focus on the concepts of light and darkness, as we can see with Kingdom Hearts. I have seen plenty exemplify light is not good and darkness is not evil, which I feel like Kingdom Hearts doesn't do much of at this point. Obviously, Riku's resolve comes through his story and he comes to realize just because he is one with darkness doesn't mean he has to let it consume him, like when he sees through Zexion's Sora illusion and I wanted to bring that up because that is when he gets that advice from Naminé is during Mm -hmm. his fight with Zexion and then Josh continues on is there anywhere else where they could talk about darkness being necessary and light not being the end all and that's what I think is so powerful about what Naminé says here is that it does cover what Josh asks it's that light doesn't like light is good but like Darkness isn't something that isn't this power that you need to, like, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Exercise from your body completely. You can use it to help your friends and to find your friends. And that is something that I kind of, like, I love stories like that. Where it kind of reminds me, I'm going to digress a little, but it kind of reminds (laughs) me of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Don't kill me (laughs) out. But in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, they talk Uh about the gentle darkness and then the light of destruction, which is like, oh my God, God, that's so crazy. You know, but I love when stories kind of take the black and white, normal, typical tropes and really flip it on its head and say, they make you look at yourself. They make you look at yourself and go like, okay, what is this part of you that you're ashamed of that really actually isn't all that bad? 
And then yeah. what's this part of you that you think is good? You think you're doing good for the world, but you're actually hurting people. It really makes you look inside yourself and kind of readjust yourself. And that is something I really love in stories. Yeah, that makes it interesting. It it gives, you know, a very natural conflict. Like, if light was truly good and light or darkness was truly evil, they would be the same word, right? Like, they would, there would not be different words for these things. Like, they do kind of touch on this a little bit in these first two games that, like, light cannot exist without the darkness and darkness cannot exist without the light. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's a very interesting way to look at things. It's, it creates that, like, you know, that gray space of, like, moral gray and literal gray of, like, white and black mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the middle is gray. Um, it's just, it's so interesting because, like, there's a saying that, like, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? So, so like, real. you know, so people can do bad things with good intentions. People can do good things with bad intentions. Mm. It's just, that's just kind of how life is. And I, I think that is something worth exploring in, in these games. And I hope that we explore it more. And Riku is definitely, you know, one to look at in the future for for that sort of thing yeah so i i really enjoy that you asked this question josh because i i love i love riku if i haven't said it enough in this fucking in this episode <laughs> um thank you josh yeah thank you josh so we got a few more questions unfortunately we won't be able to answer all of them for various reasons and limitations um but adrian also sent us a couple questions and adrian's first question is do you think the Ansem inside of Riku's heart is the same Ansem as Soren and company defeated or an echo or is he just the form of Riku's darkness takes after his ordeal in Kingdom Hearts 1? And I personally think that if, if this Ansem we see in Chain of Memories was just an echo or just Riku's darkness taking shape, I personally, you know, kind of like how we just talked about Maleficent, how Maleficent wasn't saying her own opinions. She was reflecting Riku's opinions of himself back, right? Mm -hmm. So because of that, I don't, if that was the case, I don't think Ansem would have said, I will return. Because I don't know if Riku is really worried that Ansem will return. I think yeah. Ansem saying that and being like, my shadow lingers like I have you know, mm -hmm. whatever. I think, to me, that's saying that, like, this Ansem that we see in Chain of Memories is sentient, is aware, mm -hmm. has it has plans, you know? And to yeah. me, that means, like, he's really yeah. there in some yeah. sense. Yeah. The way I kind of see it, and I know this is horrible, what I'm about to do, <laughs> but I do kind of relate it to, like, Harry Potter, how he had a piece of Voldemort inside of him for his whole life. Oh, yeah. Like, after having his encounter with him, there's still a piece of him left inside. That's kind of how I see this. Yeah, I think like, that's a good way to describe, like, literally what's going on. So, yeah, I get it. That That's how I see it. Yeah. Uh, I'll, e I'll read uh, Adrian's last question that we're going to answer. I also couldn't help but wonder, would Riku have even struggled with Ansem and his darkness had Diz not agitated and tempered the darkness within him? Mm. So I personally, I personally think that even if Riku had, because, you know, when Riku's floating in that little void, um, mm -hmm. the voice of quote unquote Ansem, which is really Diz, is like, you could sleep in the security of sleep. Or you could wake up and see what's going on and find your truth and complete your journey, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. And I think that no matter what, if even if Diz never said anything, I think eventually Ansem would have kind of crept back into Riku and like his the void he's in or in his dreams if he's really asleep right now or whatever. I think Ansem 
is like eager to return, eager to control Riku again, Mm -hmm. eager to have some connection and some physicality, some goon that can like do his bidding and what he wants. And so I personally don't think Ansem would have left Riku alone. I think he would have come crawling back sooner or later. And he does. Yeah. He fucking does. Yep. I agree. Hmm. I guess um, the one thing that we learned in this episode is how Ansem's not going to fucking let Riku go. Uh, let him go. <laughs> He's going to be an annoying bitch and say, fight me every five minutes uh, when <laughs> Riku's walking through the castle. <laughs> Riku needs a, like a pop-up ad block. That's what he needs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yep. Um. All right. Well, I think that's it. We've reached the end of our questions. Um, mm. Mel, what are we talking about next week? So I've been debating on... On if next week's episode should be either Diz, who we keep, you know, dipping our toes in and then saying, oh, not yet. Or <laughs> if the next episode episode would be Riku Replica. Hannah, what do you think? What do you, what, what, do you, what would you like I, to do? I, I think I would like to dive into Riku Replica. Yeah, I think he's waited long enough. I agree. Yeah. Cuz I remember I remember having questions about him as I was rewatching the cutscenes. Mm. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Especially because I, like I wanted to write about him more in this one and I was like, no, I got to hold it off. I got to hold yeah. it off. So, you're yeah. right. Diz will have to wait in in line again. Um We'll get to him. We'll, we'll get, get to there. Him. But yeah, next episode is going to be about that replica of Riku. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um Mel, do you want to do our, our little CTA? Yes. Okay. Since you opened. So I don't really remember all the things I have to mention, but right now we just went over a bunch of emails. And if you were listening and you were asking yourself, well, I got some fucking questions. How do I send them in? You can send them in at sheddingstarlight at gmail.com. Thank you very much. And we are also on Spotify. Spotify question mark uh-huh. and Apple iTunes question mark uh, Apple podcast Apple podcast Close. that's what it's called uh-huh. Uh-huh. and be sure to rate us five stars because uh-huh. that really helps us out and Lord knows the two couple of cute people like us could fucking you know use the help <laughs> we deserve the stars uh, and hey stars. listen the best way you can sp- if you really like this podcast the best way you can spread the news about us is by word of mouth. So if you have a friend who likes Kingdom Hearts, especially if they're starting to play them and haven't finished all the games, and, you know, me and Hannah have a friend who hasn't finished all the games yet, and there's so much that he can't do. He can't look up cutscenes of of Kingdom Hearts on YouTube because, you know, he'll get spoiled on the suggestions. So Mm. if you have a friend that you're really looking out for and you're going to be, you're trying to, like, Make sure that their experience doesn't get ruined. Well, guess what? You can trust me and Hannah because we don't talk (laughs) about spoilers of future games. That's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here for. We are newcomer friendly. So if you have a new Kingdom Hearts fan, you send them our way. We'll take care. We'll take care of them right now. We'll take real good care of them. We'll give them a little kiss on the head and And send them on their way. Yes. Give them a lunchbox. Um, (laughs) I'm digressing and I don't know what else to do. Um, YouTube. YouTube. Um, be sure to like our videos uh-huh. on YouTube if you do watch uh-huh. us on YouTube. Uh-huh. And be sure to leave a comment because yes. I'm in a bad habit of getting to questions on YouTube. But I know that people do have questions on YouTube. So don't be afraid to ask questions on YouTube because emails mm-hmm. can be long, mm-hmm. can be tedious and associated with work. And nobody likes to work. <laughs> uh-huh. I don't like to work. And so... You can always leave your opinions on there, especially, you know, if maybe there's something we can improve on. We like to read, you know, on what we can improve on and stuff. We don't mm-hmm. always agree, but, you know, we do the best we can. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's yeah. perfect. Um, yep. And subscribe. Uh, and subscribe. Oh, my God. Duh. And subscribe. <laughs> uh, okay. Help us grow. I think that's it. That's it. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. We love ya. We love Kingdom Hearts. We love Riku. And we'll see you next episode. And we'll we'll see see you in in the starlight. starlight.